And let's see. So this week we're going to talk about strings um, and lists because a string is a special kind of a list. So this is our first foray into collection. A string is simply a collection of letters, some visible, some non-visible. A list is a generic collection of things. A list can be a collection of strings. It can be a collection of objects that we're going to create later on. It can be a collection of all kinds of things. But this is our very first introduction into how to do string manipulation. That's important because lots of things that you're going to work with in Python are strings. So you really have to understand how to uh, manipulate them well. And also, all of your input, even to your project, is going to be based on text. It's going to be based on somebody typing in something to your program. So you have to understand how to use that text in an efficient way. So what is a string? An ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. Seems simple, but that's all it really is. The other thing a string is, is immutable. Immutable means the string itself can't change. Now that seems um, counterintuitive because don't you have to change strings sometimes? Yes, you do, but you don't ever actually change a string in Python. You create a new string based on the old string plus the change you want to make. And Python gives you a mul just a massive amount of um, functions to do that with. So this is what a string is. It, it, I have a variable. I know I have a variable called myster. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is a double quote, some characters, and an end quote. So that is a string. This is what Python sees. Python sees the name of your variable, myster, and the value is a series of characters. Now, in this thing, you'll also see it's not just letters. There are spaces. A space is a character. A new line is a character. A tab is a character. So there are all kinds of um, characters that we don't see. They're invisible to the naked eye. So, a rule, something that everybody's going to have to remember is that for every open quote, you must have a closing quote of the same type. So if I open with a double quote, I've got to close with a double quote. If I open with a single quote, I've got to close with a single quote. Now, there are no differences in the quotes in Python. A single quote and a double quote behave the same, but you have to have them balanced. You have to open with the same kind of quote. You have to close with the same kind of quote that you open with. So, what isn't a string? So this is what you'll see in your script. What Python will see is a syntax error, and we'll go through some of these in PyCharm. And that's because it's missing a closing quote. This is also a syntax error, because I have opening with a double quote, and I'm closing with a single quote. And this is also a syntax error because I have too many quotes. Okay, I have a double quote to start with, and then somewhere in the middle I have a double quote, and at the end I have a double quote. Well, why is this an error? This is an error because Python doesn't know what your string is. So what Python's going to do is it's going to say your string is, this is a space. And everything after that is a syntax error. There are ways to put double quotes inside double quotes and single quotes inside single quotes. Um, it's called escaping, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the easiest way to solve this problem is actually just to surround the whole thing with single quotes and put the double quote in the middle. So for every open quote, there has to be a closing quote of the same type. 
I, I emphasize this because I see this a lot. When people are starting to do their first couple of programs, they don't balance their parentheses for functions and they don't balance their quotes and it causes trouble. How do you correct those syntax errors? Well, the easy way to correct them is to correct the quotes. So I'm going to add a closing quote to the first line. I'm going to open with a double quote and I'm going to, instead of closing with a single quote, I'm going to close with a double quote. And then on the following one, there's two different things I can do. I can open with a double quote, close with a double quote, and in this case I'm choosing to escape. So I put a backslash there. And it escapes the double quote and it tells Python this is just the double quote as a character because that's part of the issue. A quote is a character, but how do you use it in a string if it's meant to delineate the string, if it's meant to tell you the beginning and end? Well, you do that by escaping it, which tells Python, hey, Python, use this as a character. Don't use what's right, the character after me, as its special purpose, which in this case is to surround a string. Use it just like a character. So what do I mean by an ordered collection? This is where we're going to start talking about lists. Okay? When I... When Python sees the words, this is a string, it actually puts them into these little blocks. This is what you can think of. And it's ordered, and how does Python keep the order? What Python does with every list, strings or lists, is it assigns a value to each character. And that value is the order that that character lives in in that list. So this can be read, T is at index 0, H is at index 1, I is at index 2, and so forth. So you will notice here that my indexing starts at 0 and it ends at 15, even though there are 16 characters in my list. That's because it starts at 0. Every single list that you deal with in Python starts at zero. There's no way around it. That is just the way it is. So the first character is always zero, and the last character of a list is always at index length minus one. So if my length is 16, my last index is going to be 15. So this is a visual about what Python sees and how it handles a list. And it's not just lists of it's not just lists of characters. It's not just strings. When we get into week six, and we really dive deep into lists and dictionaries, you will see that that's that that's the same thing that it does. So remember that every character in a string has a numerical index, and that's how you get at the individual characters. So. A list, we're going to talk generically about lists for just a minute. A list is an ordered collection of elements, and it's mutable, which means it can change. So here you see I have something called my list. My list is the string Lisa, the number 42, and 3.14. So I can have anything in a list. They don't have to be um, the same type. So you don't just have a list of strings. You're not forced to that. Some languages like Java require that your list be of the same type. So you could only have a list with every element as a string. You could only have a list with every element as an integer. That is not the way it is with Python. Python allows you to mix and match. Okay, so this is what Python sees. Python sees my list and I have three values, and I have Lisa is at index 0, 42 is at index 1, and 3.14 is at index 2. And they're all called elements. And the way a list works is there's additional syntax here. To define a list, 
that is not a string, because a string is the special form of a list. To define a list, you start with an open square bracket, and you close with a square bracket, a closing square bracket. These have to be balanced, just like your parentheses have to be balanced, and quotes have to be balanced, your brackets have to be balanced. So you start with one and you end with the other, and that tells Python everything in between these two is in my list. So uh, let's do this. Um, I think I just said all that. Oh, lists are separated by a comma. Sorry, list elements are separated by a comma. That's how Python knows when one element is done and it should start the other element to put it in the blocks that it's creating. Actually, it's creating memory blocks. Okay, so let's go back for a second. Yes. There should be audio. Can everybody hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Amy, I don't know what's wrong. Okay. So let's go back and do one of the challenges in PyCharm. Uh, let's see. Okay. This is this is um not really dealing with what I want. Okay, let's look at this. This is just, it's not necessarily about uh, strings, but it is about lists. This is challenge 3 point, sorry, 2.21. And what we're doing here is we have a list. We have a list of Gus, Bob, and Zoe. I have a variable called short names. The variable short names is a list. Python knows it's a list because it starts with an open square bracket and ends with a closing square bracket. And then lines 5, 6, 7, and 8, what am I doing with these square brackets? What I'm doing with those square brackets is I'm getting at an element in the list. So let's just run through this in the debugger real quick. Challenge 221. Okay, two, two, one. There we go. So, I'm just going to debug because I love the debugger. I think it makes things very clear. So, for those who, who weren't here last week, I am running this in PyCharm in my debug, in the debug mode. What debug mode does is it, is it allows me to walk through and watch the execution of each and every line of code in my Python script. So I know exactly what that Python, um, that line of Python code is doing. Now, the line of Python code will always do exactly what I tell it to do, and that's a wonderful thing. It is also not a wonderful thing, because if I tell it to do something wrong, it's going to do something wrong. Which, mean, which, which means that the problem was between the keyboard and the chair, which is me. So the debugger helps me understand, especially if I've created a logic problem, a logic error. So what am I doing? This blue line means that I am stuck at a line of code that has not yet executed. The red dot here is me telling it to stop. So. All I have to do to create a breakpoint, which is what that red dot is, is to click by the number in PyCharm. And what I'm telling PyCharm to do is stop. Just don't execute the line of code. Now, I know that, ex that line of code has not executed because when I go down here and I do frames and variables and I look at my variables tab, there's nothing there. What will show here 
are all of the variables that I've defined and what their current values are. So I don't have anything defined because I haven't actually executed a line of code yet. So to execute that line of code, I'm going to hit this button here called Step Over, or you can use F8. And when I do that, all of a sudden I have short names, which is a list. It has three elements, and the elements are Gus, Bob, and Zoe. So what I want to do, right now I just want to access that information. So what I do is I, I have short names. And I'm saying, hey, Python, get me the element at index 0 from short names. So what's going to happen over here on the console is I'm going to print Gus, Bob, and Zoe. Now, here's something to, to look out for. Because right here, I've just added another print statement. So if I run this. I'm going to get a big nasty error. This big nasty error is on line 8 and it says list index out of range. That's because there are only three elements in my list and I have already, I and, and the first element is always an index 0. So that's why you got that error. If you look at index out of range it means this number is wrong. It is too, it's too big. So, could somebody please uh, mute their mic? Okay, so what can we do with a list? Well, crud. You will hear me use this terminology throughout this class. Crud means create, read, update, and delete. Those are the things I can do to a list or to any collection. Create means I make something new. Read means I get at the data within that list somehow. Update means I'm going to change the list in some way. And delete means I'm either going to delete something from that list or I'm going to delete the whole list. So that's what CRUD means. And we're going to talk about CRUD as we go through this class with lots of different things. So when I create a list, I can create an empty list. The empty list has no elements between the square brackets. This is completely valid. I can also create a list with information in it. So I can create a populated list, it's the same as the list was. On the last slide, I can read a list. Oh, this is in the wrong order. So I can print my list. And I print it by using this specific syntax. I have the variable name, which is my list. And then I'm going to have an open square bracket. I'm going to have the index of the element that I want out of that list. And then I have a closing square bracket. And that's how I get to, in this case, the word Lisa. I say, OK, Python, go to my list and get me the first element, which is at index 0. So that is create, and that is read. Sorry, this is just another example of it reading. Update means I'm going to modify it somehow. Now for a list, not a string, but a list, a list can be changed. So I can remove elements from it. I can add from it. And in this case, I can change an actual element. It was 42, and now I've made it 25. Simply by using the name of the variable that contains the list, open square bracket, the number that I want, the, the number of the element that I want. So in this case, it's the second element. So the index value is 1. And then I'm going to set equal. So I'm using it just like I use a variable. And in this case, I'm going to set it equal to 25. So instead of 42, the number is now 25. So that's pretty, pretty handy to be able to just use a list 
element like a variable. And all I'm really doing is I'm swapping a met in this case, I'm swapping a number out in memory space. So I can also add something to the end of the list. I have an append function. Now the append function uses something kind of new. It's called the dot notation. So when I want to, when I, when I have a structure like a list and I want to do something to that, Python gives me lots of stuff. It gives me uh, lots of different functions that I can use. And in this case, it gives me a function called append. Now what does the dot notation do? The dot notation tells Python, Python, I'm going to append something to my list. So you'll read it kind of left to right, or sorry, right to left. So basically you could read this. I'm going to add the word add. I'm going to take the word add and I'm going to append it to my list. So that's what the dot notation does. The dot notation is what you're doing to. And when we, we'll, we'll figure out a little bit more about that when we get into objects, but that won't be till the end of the class. So my list.append adds something to the end of a list. Now I can delete something from a list as well. I have a new keyword. It's called del, D-E-L and I want to delete something from the list. So I say DEL, which is my keyword. I give it the list, my list, and then I give it the element that I want to delete. I want to delete the first element. So what Python does is it removes that element and then it renumbers everything in that list. So if I took out the very first item, which I did in this list, then it's going to renumber every single thing and the, the item directly to the right or after element zero becomes element zero. And um, I can remove, not just based on index, but based on value. So the remove function is again using the dot notation. So it's basically saying remove from my list the element with the value add. So it goes out and it finds an element add and it takes it away. So now I only have two elements in the list. Then I can also delete an entire list. Del is a keyword and in this case I'm saying del my list and, my, and, and without the brackets and it's going to remove everything is to remove the whole thing from memory. My list won't exist anymore. Let's take a look. Any more questions? No. Okay. So why did we talk about lists? Because a string is a list that can't be modified. So what do you want to do if you want to change strings? The way you change strings is you copy and modify. And the modification happens in Python on the creation because we're going to be using a lot of those functions that use the dot notation to make these changes. So CRUD applies kind of. I can create and read just like any other list. I can delete. If I want to update, I have to use special functions. And they talk about some of those in Zybooks and there are so many more that um, we don't even touch on in this class. So. Let's look at CRUD for string. I can create an empty string. I can create a populated string. I can read from a list. I have my string. This is a string. And if I say print my stir, open square bracket, zero close square bracket, I'm going to get back the letter T, the capital letter T. If I want to print, the 10th element in the list, or sorry, the 11th element in the list, which is at the index of 10, then I can simply say print my stir of 10. Excuse me, and I get back 8. Now, I want to read 
and create at the same time. This is called string slicing. And what I'm doing is I am taking a start index and an end index, and I am creating a new string from a portion of the old string. So I have a string called Meister. Meister is, this is a string. It goes from index value 0 to index value 15. I want to create a brand new string called my new stir, just from the 10th, 11th, and 12th characters or indexes in my string, in my stir. The way I do this is a special notation provided by Python. I have, well, let's read the whole thing. The left-hand side is my new stir. It's a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is the name of a previously created string, open square bracket, a number, colon, another number, close square bracket. That notation tells Python you want to get a chunk of an existing string. It's going to start at index 10, and it's going to go to 13 minus 1 index. So it'll only go to the 12. So that's the one thing you have to remember with strings and slicing and lists is a lot of times the functions that Python gives you are not inclusive for the end index. So the end index value here is not inclusive of that number. So it will always be 1 minus that end value. So that's how I'm going to create a new string from an old string and get a portion of a string if I want it. So let's see what's the next one. 2.9.1. Let's do that one because I think this is one is important. 2.9.1. Okay, so here is a, um, oh, this is start index, end index. Okay. So let's do this. Um, this is just the cow jumped over the moon, and I want to get a portion of the lyric from that. So let me edit the configuration, 291. There we go. So I've got my trusty debugger breakpoint set, and I'm going to debug this. I look at frames and variables. Nothing is there. And then I step over that line, and what it's asked, it's waiting for me to put something in. So I'm going to put in correct numbers this time. And then next time I'm going to put in some numbers that aren't correct, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to say 4, and I'm going to say 10. So those are my two numbers, my start index. Whoops. Sorry. i got to put and my indent, end index. So now I have rhyme lyric. So what do I have? I have a start index of 4, an end index of 10. I have now got my lyrics. So I want to get the sub lyric starting at index 4 and ending at index 10 minus 1. Whoops. So when I do that, my sub lyric is cow juke. And then it's going to print it. Pretty simple. You just have to remember that this is the syntax for that. So let's see what happens when I mess this up. In a couple different ways, I'm going to mess things up. So first of all, I'm just going to run it this time. And it's waiting for something. So I'm going to say minus 1. And what do I get? Oh, that wasn't right. I didn't hit a 1. Okay, so I'm going to say minus 1, and I'm going to say 22. Wow. I thought it was going to give me an error, but it didn't give me anything. So it, it is truthful. It's not going to give me anything. I thought Python was going to throw an exception there, and I'm wrong. Some syntax issues. If I forget this, 
I have a syntax problem. PyCharm will tell me where it is, and if I run it, I'm going to get one of the things that makes people crazy when they write programs. What you'll see here is you'll see that it's telling me the problem is on line five, and there's a problem with the P in print. That's invalid syntax. No, it's not. It's very valid syntax. Line five is perfectly fine. Line four is not. So when you see an error like this, a syntax error, a lot of times you need to start where it's pointing and then move your way back. So in this case, my problem is that I unbalanced my uh, square brackets. Now I could also do a string issue there. I'm going to print it, and I'm going to get an EOL while scanning string literal. This is actually helpful because it tells me the exact line that it's on. So let's keep going. Okay, so a little more about string slicing. This is just some really handy um, shortcuts that you can do when you're string slicing. So I want to create a string starting at index 8 and going to the end of the string. I don't have to calculate the end of the string. Simply leave the second number off after the colon and you will get the remainder of the string. And I can do the opposite. I can say, get me a string from this other string starting at index 0 and going to 4 minus 1. So those are some nice shorthands. Now, some more string methods. Now, why am I mentioning these string me methods? I may very well be mentioning these string methods because you're going to have to use them in the lab. So I want to find the index of the first character in the string. What do I do? I do str.find, the function with the dot notation. And what it's going to do, it's going to find me a string in an existing string and give me back where that string starts, the index number. So that's what find does. Find says, find me the first instance of a lowercase s and give me back the index, and in this case, the index is 3. The other one will replace a portion of the string and create a string on the way out. So this is one of those places where it's going to update the string and return a new one. So in this case, I'm using the replace function, and the replace does just that. It's going to take, it's going to find one string, and it's going to replace it with something else. Now, remember, when it's doing the replace, it's not really modifying your string. It's creating a new one. So you always have to remember to have a variable on the left-hand side of a single equal sign before you do this replace. So. The other one is to count the number of occurrences of a character in a string. Just use count. It's a dot notation. And all you're doing is you're giving it a character. And it's going to count the number of times, in this case, the lowercase i shows up in my string. And in this case, it's 3. And you may just have to use count in a lab this week. Splitting and joining. It's important to understand splitting and joining because you are going to use it through the rest of this class. Almost everything you do that has a list is going to come through Zybooks as a string that's getting ready to be split. So what does the split function do? The split function uses what we call a delimiter. It's just a character a character that is used only for saying this delineates the difference in an element because lists have elements. Strings don't. It's just a lot of characters. 
we have to give that string meaning somehow. So what we tell it to do is, in this case, use a comma. And when you go through this string, Python, and I'm using the split function, I want you to, every time you hit a comma, take what's to the left of that comma and put it in a list. And then go to the next one, put everything to the left of that comma till the first comma, put it in a list. So what it does is it creates a list, and in this case it's a list called my list, and there are two elements. The first is a string with the, with the characters first in it, and the second is a string with the characters second. First is at element zero, or index zero, Second is at index one. So you're going to have to split things all the time in this class. Join. What you're doing is you're taking a list and you're creating a string. Now this dot notation looks a little different. And that's because what you're doing is you have to be working off of a string because you have to use it with the dot notation. But if you're creating something from scratch and you don't really want anything else in it, what you want to do is do an empty quote, empty double quotes dot join. And that will create you a string with just the stuff in the list. Now you could do it with something in between those quotes, but it's, it's going to add that to the string. So if you just want those two elements in their own string, you do a an empty quote dot join. You're going to be using a lot more split in this class than you are join. Okay, string formatting. We had a little bit of fun last week with string formatting. This week we're going to start using different notation. And the notation that we're using really is about code readability. It's so much easier than putting pluses in between things. And what these are, are they're called format specifiers, and they are used for parameterized string formatting. So when I look at this line of Python code, I see these squiggly braces. I see three sets of them. I have two sets, one at the beginning and one at the end, that have nothing in them, and then I have this squiggly brace in with colon two dot f in it. So each of these squiggly braces is a placeholder. There are two empty placeholders and that's just fine. There's also a single placeholder in the middle with a format. That single placeholder is with the format is meant to, to print out the string that it's going to get or sorry, the, the value that it's going to get in a certain way. So let's look at the example. We're going to go back to that. I have num equal 42, pi equals 3.14, and my stir is pi day. So string formatting is positional. It only deals with places. So the first squiggly brace always goes to the first argument in the format. Oh, and I didn't mention that's the last one. What we're using here is we're using another string function called format. Let's go back. I skipped over that. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're using a string function called format. And I know it's a string function because it's a dot notation after these quotes and there's stuff inside of it. So what's going to happen is the use of this format is going to give me back a new string. That new string is going to have the values for num1, float1, and myster in that new string. So what it's going to do is it's going to take num the value at num1 and it's going to drop it right there in the first placeholder. It's going to take the value for float2 and it's going to drop it right here. And it's going to say, okay, give me only two decimal places after the whole number. And then it's going to take Meister, and it's going to drop it right there. It is positional replacement. 
format doesn't know anything about num1, float1, or meister. It just knows those are three. There are three variables there with three distinct values, and those values are going to be put in a place, in place of these placeholders. So, whoops. Let's do that again. Okay, so what do I mean by positional? This is what I mean by positional. The first, now the, the value of num1 is 42. It's going to put 42 in the first placeholder. It's going to put 3.14 in the second, where the second placeholder is. And it's going to put pi day where the third placeholder is. So what I'm going to, what it's going to give me back as the brand new string is, I'm 42 and it's 3.14 pi day. So now let's look at another example, and this example is going to be a syntax error. So I have num1, pi, and meister. What have I done? I have taken and I've switched meister and pi day. There's a syntax error here, and the reason there's a syntax error is because of the colon dot to f. That colon dot to f says only take a float, and I've just tried to give it a string. So if you're using format specifiers like colon dot to f, which you may just have to use in the lab this week, make sure that wherever that particular placeholder is, there's a float value that's going to go into it. Okay, the format specifier must match the type of the variable. We know that format specifier, by the way, is looking for a float because it ends in an F. Okay, so now we're going to go over the labs. Lab 2.12 is um, lab 2.12 is not a fair lab. We're asking you to use conditionals, and we don't talk about them till next week. The fact that they have half of half a page on them in Zybooks isn't good enough for me. The solution to lab 2.12 will be up tomorrow on the YouTube channel. It's the only time I give you a solution for anything. And we will go over what they're looking for. It's all about adding things together. But you do need to be able to do conditionals for this. The solution has an if and an else statement in it. So I have provided you the solution. Um, so don't get frustrated because we're not getting into branching and decision making until next week. So there's absolutely no reason they should have put a problem that requires branching, branching and decision making in this week's. So what you're going to do is basically they're going to input either two or three strings, or a string with either two or three, um, yeah, two or three elements in it. It's going to be the first name, the middle name, and the last name. And if that is what you get in, then it's last name, comma, first initial, dot, middle initial, dot. That's the way the format wants it out to come out. Otherwise, they're only going to give you two, and it's going to be input first name and, for, and then comma, first initial, period. And that's the problem. It's that there are two choices, and we don't know how to make choices yet. So here's just the uh, flow chart for that. And like I said, the, um, the script will be up um, on the YouTube channel. So basically what we're doing here is we're going to input last name, first name, and middle name as a single thing. And we're going to split it. This is one of those things where we have to use split. Um, Zybooks basically says it's going to input last name comma first name or last name comma middle comma first name. So we know that we're going to split it. I'm sorry, no, no, no. It's a space delimiter. It's last name space first name or last name space middle name space first name. So it's going to use the space as a delimiter. So where we would have had split with a comma as the delimiter, we can have split with space as a delimiter because the space is just another character. And then there's this little triangle, which we don't talk about until next week. 
So if the length of the list is greater than 2, or is not greater than 2, then we're just going to do an output statement for name list of 0, name list of 1. And then, if it is true, then we're going to put out the last name, the middle name, and the first name. And they also ask you to do a uh, um, multi-dimensional list, which we don't get until till week six. So 2.13 is something that you can do with what we've given you. So they're gonna, you're going to input a string, and it's going to contain a character and a phrase. And you want to output um, the number of times the character appears in the string. So we have an input and an output. And the character, that original character, you're going to have to count the number of times that it appears in the string. Now, we did an example with count. So I'm going to start. I'm going to declare my stir. I'm going to input it. I'm going to declare my list. I'm going to input my split. Sorry, I'm going to split my stir into a list and I don't remember what's going to be comma or space delimited I'm going to declare care count as a variable whoops hit one too many okay I'm going to declare care count as a variable I'm going to select the character count to I'm going to set care count to the character count that's in section 2.10 you're going to use the count function and I'm going to output the character count, and I'm going to end. So I have two new things here. I have to split my string, and I have to count the number of characters. Splitting uses the dot split function with that dot notation. So you're going to have the string dot split, and then whatever you're going to split it on, the delimiter. And then you're going to use the count function. So on the string, not on the character in the string, but on the second element in the list that you've created from the split, you're going to want to run a count on that with the character. Okay, so 2.14 is a little bit longer, but it is very doable with what we've been given so far. Okay, so you're going to enter two words and a number, each in separate variables. Then you're going to output two words in a specific format. So this looks to me like it is the perfect time to use the format, uh, to use the placeholders and the dot format function. And then you're going to put the output, the length of each password that you've already created in step two, um, which is the number of characters in the string. And then you're going, um, so yeah, that's the last part. So what do we do here? And um, this is what we do. So we're going to declare three words, and those are going to be input separately, so you don't have to split. Then I'm going to declare two variables, password one and password two. I'm going to put, I'm going to set password one to num word num, and I'm going to set password two to word underscore word two. And I'm going to output password one, output password two, Output the length of password 2 and output the length of password 1. And I'm done. And by the way, this is the last time we are going to be using uh, flowcharts because flowcharts start to take up way too much space. Um, and they really can't be, um, they really can't, well, sorry. Next week we will be using some flowcharts, but after that we pretty much stop. Next week, we're introducing pseudocode, so I will also be going over the pseudocode next week. So that's it for the lecture. Uh, find x start. The example shows myster.find 00, 2, and returns 5. Okay, the myster equals boohoo. Why does 2? return five if it's not the fifth index character. I don't know, let's see. So in the example for find. Oh let's see. Let's run this through PyCharm real quick. 
Uh, Python file. We're just going to test. Okay, stop running what you're running. Let's try it again. New Python file. Oh, it already exists. All right. One more time. Python file. Boo-hoo. Okay. Okay. So let me know. And you can actually open up your mics now if you want to talk. Um, let's see. So I have my stir equals who who found. And then I'm going to do a find Let's see what happens. Okay. The configuration. Let's put a boohoo. Boo. Okay. So we're trying to find. Oh, no. Zero, zero. Oh, oh. Okay. Well, let's also look up something. Let's look up. Find cancel. Okay, so find has sub start end. So this the sub is the string, the start is the optional. Uh, search start position and the end is the optional end position so let's look at what it says down here find B it's going to find it as 1 so that would be 0 1 find B between 2 and 4 so 0 1 2 3 so it's only going to find it there so this is find B 2 so it's going to start at Two zero one two, and it's going to find it at three. So that's how that works. And by the way, I went over that so that everybody could see kind of how to go out, find it, and read it. Whoops, wrong one. Nope, nope. There we go. That's the right one. So this is saying find two double O's after the second element. So let's see what happens. Debug it because I just like the debugger. So we have boohoo. So boohoo is zero one two three four five six. So it looks to me like five is correct because five is the index of where the second O starts. So it's five. And the reason it did that is because it's five is where that second O starts. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Did you guys want to go over um, anything about PyCharm or any of the labs in any more detail than what I did in the lecture? Okay, going once, going twice. I hope everybody had a good evening. Ah, more on the lab. What lab?
Give me one second to pull it up. Okay. Oh, sorry. I was putting the sleep. <laughs> Let me hunt for it here. Hold on one second. Do you know what the lab number is? Kelly, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So I was Sorry, I was muted when I answered your question. I was stuck on 212, but I can't find the spot that I'm stuck right this second. One second. Um, for 212, the, the answer will be up on the YouTube video tomorrow. You're not given enough information to do 212 correctly. Oh, okay. Okay, great. And that's going to be linked in the announcement? Uh, that will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay, I'll have to make sure I subscribe. Do you have a link? Yeah, I think I have the link. I'm just going to look for it really quick in my stuff. I, make sure. I just saved things to a playlist. That way I had it all. Uh, okay. There, I'll just put it in the chat. There's the link to the YouTube channel. So what this has on it is it's got about two years worth of these videos. Um, I just keep keep them out there, and about every th third year I get rid of the old videos and I just let them drop off the end. So this is what we did last week. Um, if you're interested in playlists, there are playlists of Module 1 and playlists of Module 2. There will also be a playlist for every term. So this playlist is 23EW5. Last was 23EW4. If you want to work ahead and you've got some questions, um, they're completely out there and available. When you look at the... Um, hey, did you get the Google Fire? When you look at these, what you'll see in the description is this. Okay, it's just a little blurb and then it gives you the all of this uh, link to a Google Drive which has the scripts for all of the challenges because the challenges are not graded. And then it has, in this case, other useful scripts, just some other stuff. I also have links to the lab flow diagrams and in Module 2 there will also be a link to lab 2.12. So that's what's out there on the YouTube channel. No problem. So does anybody else have any questions? Going once? Going twice? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to stop screen sharing and you guys have a wonderful weekend. And if you're in my class, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions.